we can be cost competitive. So if people are used to super high performance building, they're gonna do like double two by six walls and it's gonna cost a lot more than what a shell from TimberAge is gonna cost. And panelized walls is a really great tool to give builders to be able to approach high performance building, even up to the point of passive house. So our panels are R52. We're handling all of the air barriers and the structural components all the way out to making it cladding ready. The way that we say is you get something from us that for a thousand square foot house can likely be put up in two to three days. It'll be finished ready on the inside and it'll be cladding ready on the outside. In three days, you'll have a fully insulated shell that is beautiful, is super long lasting. You can put the right kinds of windows. You're ready to certify it as a passive house. It's a neat way to be able to address attainable housing. This is the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady, and we talk to sustainable building experts. Today, we caught up with Kyle Hansen, the founder and CEO of TimberAge, an inspiring residential mass timber company out of Durango, Colorado. They are changing the game with their high-performance modular panelized homes made with locally harvested timber as the main material source. In fact, TimberAge is producing high-performance homes at just half the cost of traditional methods. That's right. For only $85 to $110 a square foot, you can get an R52 fully insulated mass timber CLT residential shell, all locally sourced with Colorado Ponderosa pine. You'd get a finish ready on the inside and a cladding ready on the outside home. Kyle says with the right window package, it would be a certified passive home that will last 200 years and it would be ready in just three days. But before we jump in, if you want to learn about residential mass timber and network with experienced professionals like Kyle, we just announced the 2024 Residential Mass Timber Summit taking place in Denver. Head on over to the website to learn more and get on that waiting list. This event will fill up quick. So with that, let's get into it. Hey guys, I'm Kyle Hansen, the founder and CEO of a pretty amazing little company called Timber Age Systems stationed in Durango, Colorado. We make high performance, durable, modular panelized homes. And the really unique thing about what we do is we source all of the wood within 20 miles of our factory. So we go from forest to factory and back into a building, usually in less than 40 miles. And I think that makes us very unique in the world of, of building because in Colorado, 90% of our wood materials come from out of state. So we're working at the nexus of forest health, and, and watershed health, job creation, and the creation of attainable housing that has the potential to last, you know, one or 200 years. Well, thank you for sharing that, Kyle. And Nick and I are both big fans of you and TimberAge and the entire team you've put together. One of the things that I am very excited about, and you touched on it very briefly, is the why. Why are you sourcing all of these materials locally within that certain radius? Why Colorado? Why do you use a certain tree species that you use? Can you t give us a little bit more information on that? So we moved here in 2012 and I was hired to be the business unit leader for a wood manufacturing facility in a neighboring community. I spent a lot of time with the forest service and we took a lot of Aspen, but we didn't take any of the ponderosa pine and in the area of Colorado that we're in it's predominantly ponderosa pine. So we've got forests that are super overcrowded. And it's not like if the trees are going to die from disease or if they're going to, you know, experience fire events, it's really when. So we've got these forests that are in huge need of being treated. And at the same time, we've got degreed people that are highly educated and working seasonal jobs or working second jobs just because they really can't figure out how to stick. And so people are trying really hard to be a part of the communities in this area of the country. But it's a difficult place for that to happen. And the, the housing costs is a huge piece of that. So I think the median household price in Durango right now is sitting around six or $700,000. And the cost to build is, is edging up to six or $700 a square foot. So we have this place that's full of forests in need of treatment. And we, we feel like us taking those trees, creating some highly skilled labor jobs, 
where people can work in a way that's safe and fulfilling, and then being able to to turn around and reinvest all of that effort into attainable housing in our communities is that's really the start of Timber Age. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And you guys, like you said, you do that modular, uh, modularized, panelized, uh, bio-based construction, and you're very much so focused on looking into that residential market. A lot of people would say that mass timber doesn't really fit in the residential market or it's not the best use case. What would you say to that? I, I think that when people say that, when people say that mass timber, the way that we're doing it right now, isn't a great fit, I, I think that's true. Because the way that we're doing mass timber in North America, especially, is very much based around solving the problem of trying to replace steel and concrete in larger scale buildings. The thing that's unique about what we're doing is that we don't have huge buildings to build in Durango, Colorado. We have people that need, that need residences. And so if you think about designing and constructing from the standpoint of, I, I don't need the wall to go seven stories. I need it to go one or two. And for us, a lot of it came down to, okay, we have all of this ponderosa pine. Why aren't people using it? Okay, here's why people aren't using it in a traditional manner. It doesn't make great dimensional lumber. So for us, the reason we're making CLT is because we had a tree that doesn't have great yields when you try and use it in a traditional manner. And when we knew that we were going to have some smaller diameter trees that we'd like to be able to use. And so cross laminated timber is really an answer to us trying to get more out of a tree or to be able to use, utilize more of a tree. We knew if we tried to use it in a way that was traditional, that we were not going to be good stewards. And so by us being, I mean, our, our smallest board when we cut them in the sawmill, it was five quarters of an inch by four inches. And you'd never get to use, you know, an inch and a quarter board by four inches structurally if you didn't use some other type of building technology. The, the composite nature of cross laminated timber allows us to do two things. It allows us to use a lot more of the tree. And the second thing that allows us to do is use boards that by themselves would, would be thrown away because Ponderosa pine has lots of knots, right? And so as, as boards with lots of knots dry, all those densities pull the board in lots of different directions. The really cool thing about cross laminated timber is you take all of those defects and you spread them out randomly across the panel. And all of a sudden you have this thing that if you took any one board, it would be unusable. But when they all get stuck together, they make this, you know, amazingly beautiful, stable, monolithic building structure that's plus or minus two millimeters is pretty awesome. So it's a, it's for us, it's a countermeasure to how do we use as much of the tree as possible in the forests that are the closest to us. So everything, when it comes to your product, you talked about having a high performance, modular panelized mm -hmm. product. And like, are you looking for people on the, to a complete, you know, they come in on the early phases and then you hold your hand and you produce the panels and then you're also constructing the panels on the outside. And then where do you leave them? Like what, what else do they need for that product to become a full home? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think as we've, as we've learned about what we can actually make, you know, reliably out of, out of what's available to us. We realized that just small CLT panels really is, is not what people need. What people need is something that leaves them in a spot where they can pick up and move forward with the rest of the house. And so the, the easiest thing for us to do is to say, what's the most complicated piece of building high performance housing? And it's really the shell. So we've been focused on how do we take the CLT, which is a way of using the ponderous pine, but but how do we take it to the next step so that a homeowner and a builder could potentially um, talk to us? We're always bringing in a, a design partner. So we have some that we work with. So let's just say that you're the homeowner and you're like, I really love what Timberage is doing. You would reach out to us and we would say, hey, are you looking for the cheapest thing that you can find? And they would say, no, no, we actually value things like 
building performance and embodied carbon and sustainability. And, and then we would say, okay, that's great because we're, we're not, we actually can't be interested in competing against the cheapest code minimum house. That's not at all really what we're trying to do. We're trying to make houses that last 200 years. So a big piece of that is initially just making sure that we're aligned in terms of values. If that happens, then we would, you know, refer that person to one of our design partners. And we have a, a series of guidelines that help people make what we would call a compatible conceptual design. And so that compatible conceptual design is what allows us to be able to say, okay, great. Now we can talk about price and delivery and, um, and the impact on the environment. So our value proposition really has those three components. It's, you know, how much you're going to save in terms of time, what's the cost going to be, and what's going to be the impact that you're making from an embodied carbon standpoint. So like you're starting with a much lower carbon footprint than you normally would, and you're going to have a building that uses 70 to 90% less energy to heat and cool. Before we hit record, you were talking about after you take the timber age system and you enclose the shell. You know, assuming you use the right window, it could, it could almost go passive house certifi certified. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what makes uh, your panelized system compete in that type of efficiency range? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, the, yeah, the, the neat thing, I mean, I, there's lots of neat things about what we're doing. But one of the things that gets me super excited is this idea that we... We can be cost competitive, not only with an apples to apples. So if people are used to super high performance building, they're going to do like double two by six walls. And um, it's, it's going to cost a lot more than what a shell from Timber Age is going to cost. But what we're interested in doing is, is putting a tool and panelized walls is a really great tool to give builders to be able to approach high performance building, even up to the point of passive house. So our our panels are R52, along with all of the other benefits that having CLT on the inside brings, which is a lot of thermal mass. And so there's the ability to do phase shifting in terms of, of um, temperature cycling. There's the ability to control air and even buffer the humidity levels within the house. Those are all things that just come inherently with using CLT as your, as your primary exterior walls. So, so what we deliver, is something that starts with CLT and then we're, we're handling all of the air barriers and the structural components all the way out to making it cladding ready. So the way that we say is you get something from us that for a thousand square foot house can likely be put up in two to three days. It'll be finished ready on the inside and it'll be cladding ready on the outside. So in three days, you'll have a fully insulated shell that is beautiful, um, is super long lasting. And if you're interested in this kind of thing, you can put the right kinds of windows. And if you've done the shading correctly, like you're, you're ready to, to certify it as a passive house. So we're doing a lot of the hard lifting when it comes to trying to make sure that you're controlling the insulation component, the air movement, you know, component. And and I just think it's a, it's, it's, it's a neat way to be able to address attainable housing because in the right situation and with the right kinds of subsidies, I think, you know, we're attainable housing is dependent on subsidies, but we don't need as much as some other conditions, but especially with the idea of creating communities that can last a really, really long time. It's a, it's a pr pretty novel way. And we've got, you know, huge shortages in the building industry. So one of the things that we talk about a lot is, you know, framers for every one that joins five leave and over the road truck drivers for every one that joins five leaves. And so depending on the same structure of lots and lots of people swarming a work site in a traditional manner and getting all of your materials from four states away is really not sustainable in the long term. So we've got to figure out how to build with local materials and we've got to figure out how to build with, with fewer people working on the job. Single family homes come in a, quite a few shapes and sizes. What would you say you specialize in for the smallest up to the largest? And then about what is the price per square foot can you uh, offer people? That's a great question, Nick. So 
generally speaking, obviously the the more efficient your house is, so the fewer times you change directions and the more dense it is. So, you know, stacking levels um, with our system could move you into that that range of paying $85 a square foot for the shell. The way that we price it is actually the a square foot moving through the assembly. So like for us, the way that, you know, if you give us plans, we're just going to go through and we're going to figure out how many panels it takes. Our base panels are either a four by 10 or a five by 10. So we basically have chunks of, um, you know, 40 or 50 square feet. The house gets divided up into those chunks and then we're going to price it based on that. And our walls are going to be as a starting point, $18.50 at the current prices for that square foot as you run through the assembly. So, so you can think about it a number of different ways. People are really used to thinking about it on a, a square footage basis, but it's a little difficult because the size of your walls and um, all of those kinds of things, like the, the heights definitely affect. So it could be as low as 85 bucks a square foot, it could be as high as 130. And the, the way that we're approaching the market is really knowing that um, there is there's a market for small CLT and residential stuff just because it's it's gorgeous, and so there is you know probably thirty percent of what we're doing that would be bespoke, and so it could be any size, um, and then there is you know the other seventy sixty to seventy percent that we're trying to to let move more towards fixed prices so that developers. And people that are really trying to build great stuff on a budget have a more predictable way of approaching it. And they're obviously they're going to give up some flexibility, but we know that our business model requires both because the really thing, you know, the neat thing about bespoke stuff is it, it constantly has us innovating and, but it also is more expensive because we, we have to do all the manufacturing drawings. We have to fix all that stuff. I and mean, there's a lot of upfront work that happens if you're doing something that is completely custom. If you use something that we've already designed, it's pretty quick because, and we can charge less because we can just move right to the manufacturing phase. If somebody was looking at like an apples to apples comparison for a high performance home uh, using like double two by six type framing compared to using a timber age system, what should somebody expect to see? We, we know that we have time savings, we have labor savings. Um, but if somebody is really getting down sharpening the pencil, what are they looking at straight across to, to use, uh, a traditional system versus a timber age system? Based on the, the pricing and at least the, this market that we've been able to look at, I, I would bet you're probably going to pay double for a traditionally framed our 52 wall assembly versus buying one of ours. And obviously the, the time to build it is going to be significantly longer because to, to compete with what we're doing, you got to frame two walls and there's a lot of air sealing that has to happen. So there are people that are doing it really well. And I think it's important that people understand how to do it well. Cause, cause the housing industry needs, it just needs high performance building. Um, we're trying to make that more attainable and solve the problems that we're solving. But, um, but I think as the industry moves there and as some of the incentives are moving us there, what we're trying to do is actually give contractors a little bit more of an easy button. So speaking of that, that industry shift into higher performance standards, one of the things that I've heard you talk about before is getting ahead of that curve because we know it's coming, right? And it's going to, it's going to happen in different municipalities at different times. But what are you what are you getting ahead of in terms of these performance standards that people aren't thinking about now, but they certainly are going to be thinking about in five or ten years? That's a great question. So I would say the most stringent building standard out there is is passive house certification. And when I mention passive house, people are often um, a, a little bit confused because I think people have heard about passive solar. They've heard about so passive house is actually, it's a specific, very clearly defined performance standard for a building. When it's followed, the buildings typically use 70 to 90% less energy to heat and cool than a typical code built house. 
we're a long ways from the IECC, you know, de determining that people have to build passive house level stuff. But one of the things that, I, that has actually been very difficult for me to watch is for home builders associations to lobby for energy code to stay five to nine years behind what is actually current. I, I mean, for me personally, I'm looking at what's going on in the world and I'm like, that is, yeah, it might be easy like it, for you to stay on 2012, but it's not what's best. It's not what's best for the people that you're building for. It's not what's best for the planet at all. And, and it really sets a terrible tone for the industry if what we're lobbying for is to stay where we're at, because what we're doing right now sucks. And to know that there's a better way to do it and to leave it where it's at, I think that's just unconscionable, honestly. And so I think that, um, that the fact that people are busy and they don't want to necessarily move is not a good reason um, to not force them to move. But I also understand that like, Doing it like moving to higher energy codes um, in a traditional building manner is very difficult and it's asking a lot of people who are already strained in terms of finding labor and enough expertise to build high quality homes. So what we're trying to give them is something that you could use our system and you'll probably be fine for the next 50 years of energy code changes. And you spoke at a Passive House conference just a few days ago in Denver. And I believe you had some slideshows or you at least had some, um, some good information that kind of what stood out to you at, when you were at the passive house conference. Yeah. So, so Chris Ham, our vice president of building systems and engineering, and, and I had the privilege of being able to speak at the passive house network national conference in Denver. And we also spoke with an expert in the world of carbon accounting and trying to understand carbon footprints from a building science and building material standpoint, standpoint gentleman's uh, named Chris Magwood, super neat guy. And it, it was an interesting place, um, A, because Passive House is really kind of maturing. So the, you know, 10 years ago, it was like, we're gonna have a building that performs at this level and it's going to be amazing. And we really don't care how much foam goes into it. And you, know, you guys have probably seen the pie charts about, yes, it's really awesome if you have a building that, that performs at this level for a lifetime of 50 years. But it's entirely possible to build it out of materials where even in 50 years, you won't have worked off the amount of carbon that was released in the production of the, of the building itself. And so there's a huge piece of us managing, you know, our overall, um, embodied carbon that comes from us. A, absolutely think about building performance, but if you don't start with the lowest possible carbon footprint at the beginning, you've, you've negated all of the work that's gone into trying to build this, this beautiful building that performs at a super high level. That's where the passive house world is at now. I think they have, they've realized that we're a little bit hypocritical in trying to say that we're saving the earth because we're using a lot less emissions in terms of operational energy when we've, we've invested so much and, and released so much carbon dioxide in the construction of this house. So. There's a big piece of that where it was really fun for us to be speaking at a place where people are paying a lot of attention to embodied carbon. So for us to be using a, a material, again, going back to kind of what we're doing, it's, it's wood that is, that's going to be cut down and burned for firewood. It's going to die from disease or it's going to have a forest fire. Like it has to come out of the forest. If it has to come out of the forest, then why not put it in a house where it can be there for the next 200 years and, and not, you know, releasing the carbon dioxide in the air. We use dense pack cellulose for installation. So we're starting with a shell, that shell that we're delivering, not only performs really well, gives the contractors a way to be able to approach standards that they never would in a traditional manner. It also gives them the ability to almost start with 
zero or a negative embodied carbon value. And then it starts, then that, that building starts saving energy from an operational standpoint. That really resonated with the people at the Passive Health Conference because they've been working really hard to try and move to materials that still perform well and, and don't necessarily release a lot of, a lot of carbon dioxide in their production into the air. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think a lot of people have maybe some doubts or misgivings about mass timber, you know, cutting down trees, how could that equal, you know, better for the environment? So thank you for taking time to explain that. Uh, how did you get involved in this journey? Like why sustainable building? Like how did you go from growing up to entering uh, the building industry and then deciding to flip the entire mass timber and building industry on its head, do something different, start up from scratch? put together an incredible team and kind of go back to first principles thinking to bring this to where it is today. Like what's that journey look like? Man, it, I used this example in our talk where I was like, you know, I've got an 18 year old freshman in college right now. And it's been so fun listening to her talk about being 18 and trying to figure out, you know, what decisions can I make? What decisions can I make confidently? And I think if, if, any of us go back and, and think about our 18 year old self, would you say, I know exactly where I'm going to end up. I mean, my <laughs> 18 year old self had no idea what I would be doing right now. And so I think the first thing that is probably worth saying is my journey is really, really blessed by the investment of the organizations that I've been able to be a part of and, and specific mentors along the way. So, um, and I think I get, you know, I'll have a chance to kind of talk about that at some point. But so first and foremost, it's, I've just been really lucky, I think, to have people invest in me and it's given me a perspective maybe that's, that's unique to me. I was an aquatic ecologist. Um, so I have a degree in biology and a degree in education. And I wasn't sure if I was going to go to grad school and study otoliths, um, which are like the the little bones inside the ears of fish. That's how they age fish. Um, or if I was going to end up teaching. And so I ended up teaching biology and really enjoyed it. Love the, the process of investing in young people. And that's still a big piece of what we do here. We are, we're always working with interns and classes at Fort Lewis College and our local high schools. Left teaching because I couldn't afford to take care of my family and ended up in, in industry and realized that I loved manufacturing. I love manufacturing because of the way that if it's done well, it provides safe, um, regular, and man, I think super fulfilling work for people of all different skill levels. There's a spot for every person, regardless of how they've been gifted in manufacturing. And it's neat because you can always see the, the fact that we're adding value to a product. So I, I fell in love with manufacturing and had the chance to to be um, a part of something called a lean transformation at the first company that I joined. And that was really us kind of discovering what does it look like to use world-class operational principles at this 120-year-old industrial fabrics manufacturer. And because of that, I ended up um, forming a relationship with a guy named Mark Hamill, who's a Shingo award-winning author and just a really, really great lean consultant um, who's been a, a friend and mentor for years. And that led me to, to kind of developing a lean operating system at, at Anchor Industries. And then later on, it's a place called Western Excelsior, which is what landed us out here. Left Western Excelsior, spent some time actually doing lean consulting um, with the Murley Group and spending time, you know, trying to help the state of Arizona implement a lean operating system. And that was really, I would say, this, like, that's what got me to the, the point of realizing that I was a little bit of a hypocrite because I was making really good money. I was getting on a plane 30 weeks a year and, and my kids were in a community where, um, their friends didn't stick around and their teachers didn't stick around. There was, there's just a ton of churn in the place where I live. And I know that this is true in a lot of Intermountain West communities where People come and they want to be part of a community and in a neat place that 
that offers lots of, from an outdoor standpoint and they can't stick. And so for us, we talk a lot about this idea of like, if we're doing our job at Timber Age, people will be able to stick. And we use a term called an anchoring sense of place. Like when people feel like I feel anchored, I feel like I have a home and I have a community around me that's accepted me and is investing in me. That makes a huge difference in the way that people invest in one another and the way that they invest in their communities. When I moved here, I had people ask the strangest question. It was, it was, did you buy or are you renting? And I thought, what kind of question is that? It's the strangest question I've ever heard. And what they were really saying was, I'm pretty used to watching people come into this community and rent a house and not figure out how to stay. And so I'd really like to know how likely you are to stick around before I decide on whether or not I want to invest in a friendship with you. And that's a very weird place for people to be approaching life from. And it's natural when people are churning through. And it's even worse, right, for public servants and people whose base salaries have a really difficult time allowing them to be able to, to stick. So I was getting on a plane and calling this beautiful place home and, and not spending time investing in the problems that were most apparent to me in terms of the community that I lived in. And so I, I was like, I need to, I need to figure out how to, how to invest. And in a few years of just kind of studying the problem, starting with the ponderosa pine thing, going to try and figure out how to use ponderosa pine. Okay. Okay. So I think we're going to make cross laminated timber. What is that stuff again? You know, have to educate people about it, educate me about it. How do people use it in residential? I, the only reason I know about passive house is because when we, when I started researching cross laminated timber in homes, almost every time it was someone making a passive house. I was like, what the heck is a passive house? So I learned about passive house and I went to the training and became a certified passive house consultant. And, and so I think there is this, um, this really, really clear principle that's run. And I think, you know, very much this comes out of the ideas of lean thinking, which is how do you clearly identify a problem, pick a hypothesis and test it as, as quickly as possible. Eric Reese in his book, The Lean Startup, talks very much about this idea of the minimum viable product. And how do you just turn tests as quickly as possible? I feel like Timbridge looks the way that it does, not because anybody is super brilliant and could think of any of this at one point, but because we've been very disciplined about saying every day, identify a series of problems, come up with a hypothesis that you can test easily and, and get everything one more iteration forward. And so we have a lot of. I mean, embarrassingly simple, but, but well-researched things that we do We're we're, we're tiny, you know, our, our CLT manufacturing fits in a thousand square feet. It's not enough, but it's possible because we thought we can never afford a huge building and a finger joining line and $800,000 press. If that's the cheapest one that's available on the market. And, and, and like, you can just keep going down the line with all of the assumptions about doing mass timber manufacturing at the current scale, which is, you know, 40 to a hundred million dollars. And there's no way that anyone in their right mind is going to invest even $5 million in a plant for a product that no one's ever heard of in a place that doesn't understand what the product is. And yet that's not a reason not to do it. It's just a reason not to do it the way that everybody else has done it. And so I think that's, that's really led us to this idea of a scale that fits with the community, fits with all of the different stakeholders. I mean, one of the things that we're up against, and you guys mentioned this, is, is people aren't, they're still not sure about cutting down trees. And, and historically, forestry, um, in especially in any place that's, that's oriented around public lands. And that's something that's unique to Colorado and a lot of the Intermountain West, if you get away from the coast, is we don't have a lot of plantations. And so the fiber that we're trying to take advantage of is all stuff that's coming off of public lands. That means that every time that fiber comes out of the forest, there was some sort of a collaboration between public, private, 
and the people that are very worried about the environment. And, and historically, a lot of the forestry efforts have been at a scale that puts the, the amount of wood that comes out and the kind of wood that comes out of the forest, it puts it um, at, at odds with the efforts of the environmental lobby. And so I think by us starting in a way that's small, so it's not like we're not, we don't want to scale, but what we would say is we want to replicate, but we have a base unit that I don't think is ever going to put us in contrast with, with the best, you know, the best of what the environmental lobby wants, what the, the best of what the forest service wants and the ability to be able to supply a, a sustainable manufacturing operation. But to be honest, our, the factory that we've designed could very easily be turned into townhomes or condos if for some reason it's, you know, it didn't work out. So we're really, we're really kind of thinking about the idea of some, sometimes some of the bets are going to probably go wrong or, or the amount of treatment that needs to happen in a specific area might change. The needs of the forest or the watershed might change over time. That doesn't mean we should keep trying to run a hundred million dollar facility and, and just keep making the working circle bigger. It probably means we should just move the factory to a place where all of those pieces are in balance again. Well, speaking about investing in people, you're doing an incredible job there because people are investing in you. And I know that you're recently uh, raising money. You're going through some rounds, trying to scale up because things are very lean right now. Like you talked about, you're you know a relatively small operation, but you have huge and you know huge hopes to grow and make this a bigger reality to be competitive in the residential space. And that's what we need is to have a uh, you know, starting out with either a carbon negative or a carbon neutral product and turning it into to passive housing, but also to be competitive on price. Uh, what were some of the rounds that you've gone through for raising and what are you looking for in the future? And then hopefully we can um, circle back and talk about your real world projects that I'm sure have been a long time coming. But, you know, if you look back, it's a blink of an eye, which is always fun to think about. But yeah, let's talk about some of the rounds that you're raising right now and then some of your real world projects that are going to be uh, put into the ground here shortly. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we were lucky enough to be a part of a couple accelerators um, and incubators early on. We were selected to be part of Next Cycle, which is something it's pretty unique. It's sponsored by the um, RREO and the really the environmental side of what Colorado is doing as a state. They take tip fees from landfills and they finance an accelerator. And we were part of Next Cycle. So we had a, a neat chance to be invested in there. And we were also part of something called the Southwest Colorado Accelerator Program for our entrepreneurs, SCAPE. And that was really the first time that we ever did anything other than just put our own, you know, kind of sweat equity and some local stuff in. And so We've, we've done a series of rounds through the years and we just closed, um, what we're calling a bridge round, which was $250,000 really to get us to the point where, uh, where we're, we're upping it. So there's obviously you don't want to, you don't want to sell any more stock than you have to. I, I anticipate that in the next year, we'll probably be doing really kind of one of our first really significant raises because we're on track to ideally we'll, we'll replicate 20% of our size every year. So obviously that means that, you know, you'd be adding your first factory, additional factory in like five years, but then it kind of starts to accelerate. And, and I think that, you know, there is, there's a huge opportunity for us to be able to have two products to offer the world. I think we offer them the Timber Age modular building system, this idea of panelized building at a high performance level. It's doing all the neat things that the product is there. But I feel like the way that we're manufacturing is a second product. And so us really focusing on factories that could be easily replicated and, and easily set up. We're using equipment that, that's available you know, in, in three to six months uh, instead of two years. And we're doing it at a size and scale that, that makes it applicable to almost any community 
the Intermountain West is dotted with lots and lots of little towns that really started as logging towns and they're struggling to make it. So we've talked about the neat thing about our replication strategy is, is we look for two things primarily. The first one we look for is, is where is an area that's been targeted by the Forest Service as one of the 31 million acres that really has to get treated in the next 10 years. And there's a lot of red spots on that map. And the second piece is, can we pick one of those spots that has a distressed community as part of it? And so if, if we're smart, I think we move into places where we provide housing for people that doesn't exist and we provide jobs that don't exist and we provide an outlet for fiber that otherwise is going to go unused. And, you know, in an ideal world, my, my personal kind of what I want to do before I die is I'd love to have created a thousand fulfilling jobs before I leave earth. And the neat thing about manufacturing is if you can do a thousand direct jobs, that means maybe you created, you know, another six to nine other supporting jobs. For me personally, that's what we're after. And so I would love to see 20, you know, timber age micro manufacturing facilities in the next 20 years. I think that would be a, a pretty awesome thing. And that's about what it would take, you know, based on our current calculations for that to happen. And, and we're after trying to really start that up in 2024. We're applying right now for some significant loan funds, specifically from the state of Colorado through their innovative housing, housing incentive program. And they're, they're putting out some really, really amazing aids to industry in the innovative housing world. And so we're looking to consolidate our existing manufacturing and then really jump off um, throughout the next two years and seeing the first big timber age facility, big for us, you know, 5,000 square feet. But the really cool thing was, you know, I think it, we can locate it in a way that takes advantage of maybe supporting other wood processing facilities. We've got an opportunity to work with the Forest Service to be doing biomass, heating and electricity generation. We've got an opportunity to really create some demand for ourselves through just generating workforce housing and, and also just, you know, then at the same time, taking care of, of some of the needs that communities have for, for more housing. So we've got, uh, we've got an, an 80 acre plan that we'd love to see happen in the next two or three years. That's a, a big piece of what we'll be jumping off from that would move us to the point where we're producing, you know, 50 to 60, 1,000 square foot homes a year out of that facility. Yeah, 50 to 60 homes out of one facility a year is, is really incredible. Uh, but it all starts with one. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the uh, homes and projects that you're taking on right now? Yeah, we were lucky enough to really kind of um, understand the Timber Age modular building system through... The, the first job that happened was an, a gentleman that allowed us to be able to use our, our panels for his roof. And we got the chance to test out some, this idea of, of taking smaller CLT panels and joining them into a bigger modular system. And that was really cool. So that's, uh, that house is finishing up right now. Then we moved on to a smaller ADU that was the first structure that was completely constructed of the Timber Age modular building system. The neat thing about that building is it was a backyard office for a gentleman, but he was nice enough to let us run it out to Washington, D.C. It spent some time on the mall during the housing and urban developments, innovative housing showcase that we had, you know, some, some Congress people and other representatives, as well as the general public spend three days walking through it and getting their chance to understand what it looked like to build with mass timber. That came back and went into a backyard that one's finishing up right now. The, the product or the project right after that was us building panels for a library for the Battle Rock Charter School. That's definitely like the biggest project that we've done to date. That's uh, 900 square feet um, as a loft area and allowed us to really be able to try out this idea of could we bring in three trailer loads of panels in three days and have a crane and set all of those panels. Um, we'll be releasing some, some video stuff, but there's definitely social media posts out there about it. It was 
so much fun. I mean, we really, we ran the crane from 10 to three every day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And in three days we had that entire building set and it was, it was a ton of fun. I mean, the, the kids, it was really exciting for them because like Thursday they like left and there was no library. And then on Monday they came back and they were like, oh my gosh. But I think it was as much, it was as much fun for us as a building team that got to do that. And then we've got, um, you know, we just finished a, a really unique job that was a young architect who wanted to build a sauna. And so there's, there's interest in using CLT for saunas. I think just because, you know, it's a, it's a neat substrate for people to be able to do creative things with. And this was super creative, all sorts of like compound bevels all over the place. That'll be kind of fun to, to look at, but that was a pretty quick job. We're moving on to a house that's going to the Socrates in New York. And that will actually be our first two level passive house certified structure that goes up. The thing that's really cool about that one is that it's a, it's a design that we could very easily, you know, help pivot and, and mold into higher density, multifamily kinds of things. So I, that's a, a neat project for us. Um, after that one's finished, then we'll be moving on to another home that will be installed here in, in Durango in one of the local subdivisions. At the same time, what really has us focused on this idea of, you know, figuring out how to expand the factory and potentially set up for a bigger raise to drive multiplication efforts in 2024 is a number of, of people who've contacted us, you know, one that is like a, a 40 unit subdivision that would really love to do something sustainable and, and workforce oriented and another one that's 90 units. Um, there's also some opportunities for us to, you know, potentially help out with density issues in Taos and, and also some of the rebuilding efforts in Greenville, California. So we've got a, a few different places that we very easily, you know, could be inundated with three years of work if everything hits. And to your point, you know, we, three years ago in September, we'd made our first panels. And we had a local builder, Elevation Builders, was nice enough to to order the first two panels from us. And it took us a long time to make the two panels. And they went into a stair landing. And and three years, you know, almost to the day, we were setting the panels on this library using a, a building system that we think is super unique um, and has, you know, a lot of a lot of advantages that don't exist anywhere else. It solves a lot of problems, both at the building science. Uh, the installer and obviously the community level. So three years, I mean, it's, it, we kind of blinked, but it's really fun because I think we were talking about that. The, the library was probably being talked about in 2020. I mean, they've just, the projects take a while to pull through. So we're at that spot now where people that we talked to a long time ago, when everything was just a theory, it's, it's exciting to see it hitting the road and, uh, and watching stuff go out and, it's been really cool to watch the effect on our team members because, you know, I've had the chance to spend a lot of time driving over to Cortez, which is, you know, an hour and 20 minutes to the charter school as we were working on that and talking to these, um, these young people that are a part of our team. And they're like, I'm like, so what do you see yourself doing in five years? And they're like, I, I think what we're going to be doing in five years is going to be freaking cool. And I want to be a part of it. And I was like, that is one of the greatest compliments ever as you're trying to create a place where, you know, right now, at least we have eight fulfilling jobs and we just want to try and figure out how to grow that. It'll be exciting to see what the next three years comes. I know Colorado is really uh, waking up. I know we're a part of the Colorado Mass Timber Coalition and there's just a lot of big things in movement that, you know, like you said, you look back on three years and it's a blink, but you know, it, um, so. So I think from a, a value and a mission vision standpoint, values, there's a guy named Andy Stanley. He's kind of a virtual mentor of mine and really one of the, the best questions that I think I've ever heard. And that is a really good one to reflect on often is what breaks your heart? And if what you're doing every day is a long ways from what breaks your heart, you're probably going to get to a spot where you're burned out and it's going to be hard to put in the time and the effort 
and the energy that it takes to to really move the world in a place where it needs to go. So I think that's a that's a great starting point. Um, I already mentioned this gentleman, Mark Hamill. Really, I've just uh, I, I I've learned so much from the guy, and it was a, a neat story because we I was in that first manufacturing job, and I was really young, and I was expected to to try and drive this idea of the anchor performance system. And I was completely over my head and I just read this book by this guy. And I was like, man, this guy like speaks my language. You know, we just have those people that kind of vibrate at the same frequency we do. And I found his email and I sent him an email and I was like, here's what's going on. I'm supposed to be like running this thing. And I'm, I'm completely over my head. Like I need a mentor. Would you mentor me? And he sent me an email back in like two hours with his phone number and was like, I'm super excited that you get this opportunity. And it's really, really neat. Like, I would love to, to visit with you about it. We all need mentors. And it, you know, turned out that we got to do, he was an executive coach for me that the company that Anchor Industries was gracious enough to pay for. And so I got this gentleman who really took a lot of great thinking and helped me figure out how to apply it as a young person in that, in that organization. What was that book again? Uh, the name of the book that I was doing at that point is something called the Kaizen event field book. And it's, it's a very like practical hands-on book for trying to help understand what it looks like to take yourself from what I would just say is a normal accepted business practice and implement the ideas that are in the principles of, of the Shingo model. So Shigeo Shingo is a guy. So there's like all these, you know, Japanese people that, again, are kind of virtual mentors because they've really shaped my thinking. But Shigeo Shingo was one of the authors of the Toyota production system. And there's a, a series of business principles that have kind of been distilled based on companies implementing those ideas. So, so that's that side. Um, man, my, you know, it, it, it might sound corny, but my, my wife is just super, super in emotionally intelligent. And so I'm definitely a little more on the analytical and introverted side. And, and my wife has, has really, I think, helped me understand what it looks like to try and, to try and focus more on the needs of the people around me and try and address those. And while I'm, it's still not necessarily something that I'm super great at, I've been able to really find a lot of fulfillment in it. And so I feel like it's very easy for me at this point in my life to realize that a group of people moving in the same direction is so much more valuable than having the right answer. And so when, when I was consulting, you know, we would talk about like the, the best answer in the room was one person behind it is not nearly as valuable as the third best answer with 80% of the people behind it. And so, so much of what we're doing is about this idea. I mean, if we're, if we're working on a problem that can be solved by one person, that's great. I, I just don't think that's the world's biggest problems. They're never going to be solved by one person. They're going to be solved by, by a group of like-minded people that have been able to find a common vision and they are chasing after it with passion because it's something worth doing. And so like life and business is, is so much more about getting a group of people going after something worthwhile and the journey that you have. As you do that, that's so much better than just getting the right answer or just getting the biggest return on unloading a company or, I mean, you don't take that stuff with you, but, but the relationships that you form with a great team are, are something that's priceless and lasts forever. So. Yeah, absolutely. That whole, if you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. together. You know, I think that's very applicable uh, to here. And especially you can definitely transpose that into fast and far, but also, you know, big problems, little problems, right? So there's lots of little problems that can be solved individually, but it takes a real team, a real tribe to solve these big complex problems like you and your team are taking on. Um, I think one of the things that's, that you re that's, that you said that really stuck out to me is you wanted to create, you know, 20 facilities, that's amazing, but you wanted to create a thousand fulfilling and purposeful jobs, not just a thousand jobs, but it was very it really stuck out to me that the two adjectives that used to describe those jobs. Um, I think that the impact that 
that you'll have on the housing industry is wonderful, but the impact that you will have on the people and the communities that you mentioned is going to overshadow and outpace that, you know, far and above anything that you're doing there. So I commend you on the work that you're doing. Uh, you have a great team. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with uh, and talk with and meet several of them. Uh, they all embody the values that you've talked about so far. Um, and so on that note, before we ask our last question, how can people connect with you, connect with TimberAge and connect with your team? Yeah. Um, so I just want to, I want to make sure that like, that's my, that's my piece. Like I, I love the idea of, of creating that, but man, it, it will not happen right without a group of people. And so, um, at this point, I think that's the most fun because it's like, that might've been what got me started. Um, but really at this point, I'm trying to figure out how to take care of the people that have been crazy enough to jump on the train with us and, and we're having a blast. So, uh, the easiest way to get a hold of us. Um, so it's kind of fun. Uh, if you Google timber age, I think that, uh, you'll, you'll find us very quickly. Um, so that's the easiest way to remember is just timber and age. And, um, me personally, um, is just. Kyle at timberage.com. I'm happy to, to visit that way. Um, info at timberage. We'll make sure that it, it goes into, you know, a bigger, bigger group. Timberage.com is our, is our website. And, and even though it's, it's not a lot of subscribers at this point, I think a lot of the most fun things, um, about timberage, you can watch in some of our videos on YouTube. So I'd also encourage you to check out our YouTube channel by Googling or by looking for Timber Age on YouTube. Of course. And we'll link all that info uh, down in the podcast notes. so Everybody finds it uh, very easily. So on that note, if you had the power to change one thing in the industries that you work in, what would you change and why? I would change the desire to try and get it right. At the beginning, I think what we've learned and the reason why we're small is because people respond to, to action much more than they respond to ideas. So there's just something about action that galvanizes people and it makes it concrete. It's a way of caring for people is to let them see progress. So I think what I would change about the industry is to say, just start running experiments. Don't, don't sit around waiting until you can get all the math to work for something at an enormous scale, like start something small so that there's the opportunity to start learning as quickly as possible. Cause I think that's what we get out of it. You know, one of the neat things about our scale is we learn really fast and we're not speaking about things in theory. Like we get to talk about when we tried this. This is what happened. And it gives like it, like the thing that, that I think sometimes we don't value enough is the confidence that comes from having done something. You don't have nearly the same confidence in moving forward if it's something you've thought about versus something that you've actually tried. And, and we need people that are moving forward confidently right now to make the building industry better, especially the mass timber industry. And I just, I think. That's going to come from us being willing to just have a bias towards action and just be asking people to experiment and giving them the opportunities to do it. And that usually means start something small. Well, that's, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge point, you know, start something small. You got a threat of Elon Musk in you, you know, that's the one thing they just keep doing as many fail forward type of activities and you'll get to the goals that you want to get to. Uh, well, Kyle, it's been a pleasure. I'm honored to be on the Colorado Mass Timber Coalition with you. I know that we'll work, you know, close and, you know, with, with people in the future. Um, we're excited. We hope to have you at the Mass Timber Group, the residential Mass Timber Summit coming up in Denver next year. And yeah, man, this was a great uh, podcast and thank you for being on. We enjoyed it. You guys, it was, it was a, it was a privilege. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate both of you and all the work that you're doing. Move this forward. Cheers. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks guys.